Hey, I'll tell you, I've been filming for 25 years, just over that with other people, and we've been filming our own show for the last, ever since July, and I'll tell you, this flathead show was the most difficult show we've ever done. It took six different nights to try to catch the fish we caught, and I'll tell you, we fished most of the night from seven o'clock at night till a couple of times we fished till five in the morning. So, you know, that's the big thing about this, this fishery and that we're really concerned about the flatheads are, is that they're, they've been overfished. So we're really not trying to, on this show, trying to stress how to catch them. We're more showing the, the capabilities and what the fishery has the potential to catch out there as far as catching big fish, but the numbers of fish are really dwindling because basically they've been over harvested a lot because of the set liners and the bank liners, but also there's been a lot of fishing pressure, you know, rod and reel pressure too. So, you know what, it might look like we really caught a lot of fish and did real well, but I'll tell you, it was a grueling one, but I'll tell you, it was very exciting. Every night we were out there fishing, I was waiting and waiting to try to get that 50 pound fish and we did have one big one on in them nights, but I'll tell you, we'll be back at that next year again to try to see what we can do for that. Hey, for Larry Smith Outdoors, remember it's a great night to be alive. down to the last couple days of flathead fishing and you know what I gotta admit to you guys we've tried this a half a dozen times on our own all we caught was channel cats and a few flatheads this time we're fishing with our good friend Sean Sonatag and I would consider him the expert at this sport for sure so what we're doing again we're trying to catch a big flathead and maybe a couple big flatheads and the season always closes on the 31st of September. So, like I said, we've got a couple days left and we're out here, we're gonna see what happens. Basically what we're doing is we're fishing the river here. We're using suckers and basically just throwing them out into the current in certain spots and waiting for these fish to come up. You wanna shove one more out there? And hopefully grab one of these big suckers. So. You know, the problem with suckers are they're so darn expensive. And the other thing is, they're very hard to keep alive. Got him. Good job, all right. Isaac, grab the nut. Here, keep reeling, keep reeling. We got two anchor ropes though tonight just because that's a nice fish. Okay. Oh shit, look at the size of that. Oh, 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 all right. Look at the size of that fish. Oh my gosh, that's absolutely awesome. Boy, I tell you, you know something? Well, 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 well worth worth it. Look at the size of that fish. Oh man, that is absolutely, this, this is what it's all about. Look at the mouth on that fish. Look at that. Unbelievable. Look at that. What an absolutely beautiful, beautiful fish. That is definitely worth staying out here and getting wet over, for sure. That is absolutely, these fish are, are just absolutely beautiful. Look at that. What do you think, Isaac? That is nice. All right, nice job. Boy, I tell you, you know what? We've come out on our own about a half a dozen times and trying to catch one of these giant flatheads. And you know what? Just like always, you're always learning, there's always more to learn when it comes to fishing, and I'll tell you, we brought the pro out tonight, 
and we already missed three of them. We caught this giant one. We're gonna let it go right now and we'll see what else happens. But boy, I tell you, well, well worth it. He's out of there. Back down. <laughs> Back down to the murky bottom he goes. That is absolutely awesome, I'll tell you. All right, let's set back up and, hey, I'm, let's stay out here a little bit longer and see what happens. I don't mind getting wet when you see a fish of that magnitude. Last night we got cut short. We had some really nasty weather, can't come in. We should have actually had five fish last night. We hooked up with one really big one. So we're back tonight and you know what? Tonight I know is gonna be a good night. You know why? Because we got lady luck, oh let's just put it, we have girl luck in the boat today. We have Gracie and Lucy fishing with us tonight and I know we're gonna get a big fish for sure. So we'll see what happens. We got a ton of rain. We'll see what this current did to the river here, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get a couple more big fish tonight because I think we only got a couple more days left and the season will be closed here. Sorry, Abby, but I am taking your job. So here's a new advertisement of the day, the book. It's called Narnia. Yeah. It's about four kids and the wardrobe. And one of the kids' name is Lucy. For all you Becker fans, I'm coming to the Becker Creek tomorrow. Come on, big fish. <laughs> Thirty inches. And that's the slot, right, 30? Yeah, that'd be a legal fish. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. You wouldn't even think about keeping a fish like that. There's nothing on them, because they're all head anyways. Yeah. So there really is nothing on the back right there. It's a nice looking fish, huh? All right. Another one down. You did, how did you know that, how did you know that we were gonna get a, get a you said in 11 minutes, and we were pretty close to, to 11 minutes we we're gonna get a bite. Look at them girls up there. They didn't even move because they knew it wasn't big enough. Isn't that something? It's, it's a big fish. Oh my gosh. It's a big fish. I thought it was a channel cat. Oh, it's a big flathead. It is a big flathead. Oh my gosh, you guys, I didn't think that was a flathead. I thought it was a channel cat. Oh, nice job. Oh, yeah. That thing was messing and messing with that bait like no tomorrow. Gotta love that, I'll tell you that. I honestly was very surprised that that was a flathead just because he kept messing with it and dropping it and picking it back up. And, uh, yeah, once I set the hook on it, I thought, I actually made a couple cranks on it and I thought he was gone and he was actually coming at the boat. So yeah, I love it. Hey, it's well worth uh, spending the night out here, I can tell you that much. This is, you know, this fish is definitely big enough legal to keep, but when you look at it, it's just, there's nothing here. It doesn't make any sense to kill these fish. Hey girls, you sound like you're a little bit cold up there, even though you got all them sleeping bags and stuff on, but you know, it's definitely time to wrap her up and head for home. And just remember, it's a great day to be alive. I'm Alan Niebuhr. I'm a senior fisheries biologist for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources stationed out of the Shawano office. And I'm Dave Bartz. I'm a senior fisheries biologist uh, for the Wisconsin DNR station out of Watoma. 
I guess starting out with a little bit of history and background on, on kind of how we got involved with flathead, the flathead fishery. Um, this stems back to actually before I even started working in this area, but uh, the, uh, basically anglers came to us. Um, there's a, a pretty uh, good fishery for flatheads and, and at the time anglers came to us because they were concerned because they actually saw a major decline in their catch rate and their uh, size of flatheads. And these are mainly set line and bank flow anglers that, that were seeing this and they were asking us, hey, you know, what, what's going on? And, uh, and that's kind of how we got started. Right. And uh, so from that, um, we, we decided we needed to get uh, a committee together um, and basically we formed like a, it was a citizen advisory committee, um, which was called the, the Winnebago System Catfish Advisory Committee, Citizen Catfish Advisory Committee. And then that committee was comprised of set line and bank pole anglers, hook and line anglers, you know, conventional rod and reel anglers. So we had a kind of a diverse um, citizenry that was represented on that committee, of course, and then there's DNR staff on it. Right, we had law enforcement. Law enforcement. And uh, that committee kind of helped us help direct kind of what direction we wanted to go in as far as management of the flathead catfish. And one of the first things that came out of it was there was a huge concern over um, uh, commercial harvest, or commercial sale, I should say, of the catfish. So that, that was kind of the first thing that happened was right. uh, the commercial sales were banned for flatheads. Sales on the wolf were eliminated initially and then we, we, we heard that there had been some movement of fishermen between the two systems coming to the fox so then we eliminated sales on the fox. And then we started to look at actual regulations yep. to yep. try to limit harvest because right. we, we felt there might be some issues with recruitment and that there was definitely some from some over exploitation taking place. Yeah, and that was kind of the, the next thing that came out from my understanding was we, you know, in the state, we haven't really done a lot of work with flathead catfish. Um, it was kind of a new thing for us to look at. We've got standard sampling for, you know, walleyes, bass, a lot of other species, but catfish was kind of this new fish that we never really looked at. So one thing the committee directed us to do was, hey, go out there and get some more information on flathead populations. And so that's kind of what we did. We, we had to refine our sampling techniques. Um, we had to look at, you know, what types of gear we could use to sample these fish. So there's a learning curve with that. We also, um, we, we wanted to learn more about different life history aspects with these fish too. So we actually collaborated with our research staff and uh, we did some telemetry work. So we actually implanted uh, radio uh, tags and we, we actually looked at uh, seasonal movement, seasonal habitat use. Um, we learned some really in interesting things about uh, those aspects of the population too. And, and then ultimately that's kind of all the information that we collected then was kind of what we used to make some decisions as far as what we needed to do next. Right. On the Fox River we initially started working with with uh, uh, guys that had been fishing the river for years, you know, since they've been kids that grew up on the river and were real familiar with the, at least the, the component of fishing for flatheads and uh, started working with them. They were catching fish for us, we were tagging them, releasing them. Then we started our own sampling, uh, initially using limb lines, which was basically a, a, a baited uh, limb line that we used to capture fish. And then we, we ended up finally getting to where we are today with our standard uh, protocol for adults using hoop nets around the spawning and then electrofishing in late summer to sample juvenile populations. We've caught fish, uh, you know, up to 50 pounds. They're pretty rare. That's, uh, you know, the, probably the largest fish we've seen. Uh, but ever since the, the regulation, the last regulation, which went into place in 2009, at least on the Fox River, we've seen an upward trend of fish in the slot and also fish between 36 and 40. And then that number of fish over 42 has kind of, at least in our sampling, remained at about 1% of our sample. We, we don't see a ton of large fish, but uh, they're still out there. But what we're really trying to protect is that spawning stock, those fish that are in that 36 to 40 inch are going to be around for a few years and that's what we're hoping uh, you know to produce the fish for the future. One of the things we learned uh, initially when we started doing our assessments on flathead catfish, um, one thing we wanted to find out about was the pressure, you know the angling pressure on the fishery. We also wanted to learn about exploitation so while we were doing our assessments we built in those objectives into our surveys and we did a lot of tagging. We did some floy tagging. It's like an external tag that goes on the outside of the fish so that if anglers catch the fish, they can report that tag if they harvest it or they catch it and release it. So, and then what we learned, which was pretty eye-opening, was, was the exploitation was actually fairly high. And, and, and we had 
In some years, I estimated exploitation as high as 30%. And uh, that's, that's kind of getting into that danger zone where you're getting into growth overfishing, even recruitment overfishing concerns. So that, that opened our eyes. Uh, we also did, and I think Dave did this too, we did a lot of uh, surveys on the river where we ran up this river with a boat and we actually did counts of all of the set lines and bank pools along the, uh, the river channel. And we did this at different time frames to kind of get an idea of what kind of pressure there was on the river. And I know on the Wolf, at least, we had really, very high uh, pressure from that type of fishery. We had, uh, on average, for the three years that I did it, between two to three set lines and bank poles per river mile, all the way up to, from the confluence and Poygan all the way up to Shawano. And so, and, you know, and it was concentrated in certain areas. It wasn't like that all the way along the river, but there was definitely some concentrated effort. So, you know, that in itself was eye-opening. Um, when I kind of looked at like a hook effort estimate based on that, and I realize that they're not all fishing their lines all year round, you know, all, all year long, but what we figured during like peak uh, uh, times when, when you know, it was easier to catch the flatheads, we had a hook effort that was as high as uh, 40,000 hooks per day, hook, hook effort uh, per day, which if you think about that from an angling standpoint, like with the rod and reel, uh, with, you know, say if a rod and reel angler went out there, that would be like almost equivalent to like 550 guys fishing in a boat, you know, or whatever, fishing with rod and reels with three lines each for, for 24 hours straight in a day. So, so it's just kind of one way to look at it. Now keep in mind, like I said, that's not what, they're not all fishing at the same time. They don't always all bait their lines. If you're familiar with set lines and bank poles, they're allowed one set line. The set line can have up to 25 hooks on it, and sometimes they don't always bait all those hooks up. And likewise, I think on a, a bank pole, then they're allowed uh, two hooks per bank right. pole, and they can have up to five bank poles. So, so that, that's something to keep in mind. But it's a lot of, lot of effort. Right. So. And we're seeing increased effort, you know, because of the publicity, obviously through shows like yours and through magazine publications. Uh, catfish overall, I think, are getting a little more attention. And, and uh, of course, they do taste good, so anglers are starting to realize that. And hook and line and bank pole set line pressure seems to be on the increase. But I, I think that with our, our current regulation, we kind of nipped it in the bud. Like I said, we've seen a slight upward trend in the fish that we're trying to protect. And uh, you know the, the, the fishery seems to be pretty healthy at this time, and uh, it, the, there is no stocking. We don't do any stocking of flathead. We, we rely strictly on natural reproduction. Uh, the Fox River, I think, has pretty decent habitat. Uh, it's a little more um, suitable for, for flatheads, I think. It's more turbid than the Wolf. We've got a lot of wood. Um, I mean, and it's it's fairly undeveloped because it's got such a huge flat uh, watershed that, that is you know unbuildable and undevelop undevelopable so we've got pretty decent habitat that I think is going to be protected for, for years to come. Yes yeah, so, you know and in the Wolf River as far as what we see for uh, our populations and what we've seen in trends um, is we we have a little different fishery than Dave it's it's a the river is not like he said is not quite as turbid and I think it's a little cooler so what we tend to see with our habitat and with our, our temperature regimes is we have a little bit lower recruitment but in, in the same token we so we have lower density populations but we do see um, I think larger fish on average right. so we have potential for growing bigger fish um, even with that you know with the cooler temperatures we still see a you know we look we've looked at growth of the fisheries and, and it, it, you know when I've looked at other you know our growth rates compared to other Midwest rivers we're, we're right at the moderate to high range you know we're, we still got some really good growth on the, on the wolf and I'm sure the fox is yep, comparable. We've got pretty, pretty pretty comparable growth between the two I mean we do manage it as a system even though like I said the individual rivers are different we see some overlap, even though it's slight of fish that move, you know, within the system, similar to the sturgeon. You but know, it, most of the Wolf River fish stay in the Wolf and migrate down and up and not in the Fox, but we do see some overlap. Yeah, there's a little bit, but it's interesting of all the thousands of fish that we've tagged, both Dave and I have tagged thousands of flatheads, uh, it's a pretty small percentage that actually mix between rivers, which right. is kind of unique. We actually do have two different stocks. And, uh, you know, it's, but once in a blue moon, we do have some fish that do find their way, you know, the Fox River fish find their way up to the wolf and vice versa. What we've learned, and, that, and, and some of those things that we've learned about their movements, really interesting too, is that they do show some very strong movements in our systems um, compared to like southern fisheries where they found that their fisheries are more sedentary, they don't move very far. Ours, uh, we've, we've tracked fish. Uh, when we did our radio telemetry studies, we had males that we tagged, and some of these fish were moving as far as 80, 70 to 80 miles to their summer habitat. 
from uh, the wintering habitat down in Lake Poygan. So phenomenal movements. And what was really interesting is that when we tracked these fish, they, they, they had really strong what we call uh, fidelity to their wintering habitat and their summer habitat, which means they would go back to these same areas right. year after year. We see the same thing on the and, fox. And Although our movement isn't quite as extensive as, as what Al sees on the wolf. Yeah, and, and what we learned too from the telemetry is that the habitat that they're using is real specific too. The, uh, the areas they would go back to were some of these uh, uh, big, like large wood, wood log jams, I mean these big, huge woody debris jams. That seemed to be by far the preferred habitat for flatheads, which kind of told us a lot about you know, these large wood jams in the river, or just large woody debris in general. That's an important habitat feature we have to preserve. Um, and then, then in, on the same token, with wintering habitat, we learned some interesting things. They were actually, a lot of fish like in the Wolf, for example, would head down to Lake Poygan, the Upper River Lakes, to, uh, to winter. I think in the Fox, it was Butamore. Right, mainly. Butamore. Some, uh, there's one thing I'd like to mention is there's been a couple of old dam removals on the old Fox and the Fox River lock system. And there uh, used to be some areas below some of those old dams that were pretty important wintering areas, but they were also very vulnerable to predation. Uh, by otters and things, and then also by illegal anglers that would go down there and actually snip, fall hook these things in these wintering holes. And that's one thing that some of Al's diving has shown that these things will concentrate in some of those big areas over winter. So they would be very vulnerable, you know, to to fall hooking or even guys just uh, you know jigging and ice fishing them. So some of the season seasonal changes that we've made to regulations were, were basically targeted at that because they do become fairly dormant once that water temperature starts to cool and they'll move into those areas and they're pretty vulnerable. Uh, that was one interesting thing we found when we were tracking these fish and we, we found their wintering sites is we actually went in the Wolf River, we dove, we used scuba gear to dive down into the holes to kind of observe them in their wintering habitat. And it was fascinating because we learned a lot about that. We didn't realize how they, how many fish actually congregate in these wintering sites. It was a high number of fish. Um, the other thing we learned is that during this, this, uh, this is usually typically November, I'd say late October on is when they, they, they go into these, these areas. The water temperature is very cold and what we found is they, they get very lethargic, just like Dave said. They don't move around much. They just kind of tucker down into these deep wintering sites and they just stay there. And, and when we dove into these areas, we, we actually uh, found that we could actually handle these fish, which was really interesting. We could actually, they're so lethargic, you could actually hand capture them. And we actually started using that as now another technique. We, we take a, a bag with us and we can actually hand capture these fish and, and put them in a bag and bring them to the surface. And then we can actually get more information, you know, length, weight, tag them and do those different things. And then we have to release them back down into the wintering site. So kind of our version of noodling, except it's really cold. <laughs> but but it, it was really fascinating as we, we, we found out some really inf interesting information about their the wintering sites because it's not every deep pool in the Wolf River that holds these fish. There's some really unique, you know, sites that you have that you have for these wintering areas, uh, and that's one reason why we went to that seat, like Dave said, with the season now. They, they are particularly vulnerable when they're in these sites, and we thought having a closure while they're really congregated would be uh, healthy for the fishery. I mean, the fishery seems to be healthy. We're starting to see a little improvement in size structure. Uh, you know, I think they've got currently the protection they need, but we do have some concern over, like I said, the increase in pressure, both you know hook end line and bank and set line, and so uh, we're, we're we've had some discussions on reconvening the catfish committee, maybe revisiting you know where where we where we're at, where the anglers think we're at, and if whether or not we need to make some additional changes to some of the regulations, uh, you know, to, to further protect the species. Definitely, you know, that's kind of we're we're kind of seeing the same trends on the Wolf River. Um, we have seen a steady upward trend and, and basically uh, our flathead population is less than 36 inches in length, but we haven't really seen uh, any big changes yet above 36 inches. And, you know, and, and I think that's kind of, you know, it, it's early in the process. I mean, right. when you think about it, this regulation's only been in effect for about uh, six years now. And it, sometimes it takes time for these things to really, to really fully realize the impact of the regulation. And when you think about it, you know these things aren't flatheads don't even mature until they're about six to seven years of age in our system. So, uh, you know, and sometimes you have to let these things go through a generation of fish. 
and, and that could take a while. Exactly, you know? yeah. They, they grow very slowly, you know, once they mature, and yep. particularly once they get, you know, above 30, 35 inches. And so, like Al said, and, let, and I just took a peek at the data before I got here, and our, our, our catch of fish over 42 has been riding about 1%, and so we, I, I think we'd like to see a slight tick in that. We'd like to see, you know, a little increase in the number of large fish that we see. Yeah, one thing we, I guess we didn't touch on is, we, we touched a little bit on growth, but one thing we're also seeing, um, we, as far as longevity of the population, we know that they live a, a long time. It's, you know, for an apex predator, they actually live a long time. Uh, what Dave and I do to estimate the, the uh, age of the fish is we actually collect two different structures. We either look at the pectoral spines off the fish and we section the base of that spine to, to look at that section under a microscope and we can see rings on it, which we can count to get the age of the fish, similar to what you do if you see a tree section. Uh, but the, the thing we found with those structures is they tend to underestimate the age. So we have now started collecting otoliths, which are small, you know, like tiny little bones in the, in the head of the fish that we can extract. Of course, we have to sacrifice the fish to get them. Right. But mainly we get those from anglers. Those are using anglers. We get them from fish. anglers, yep. And then similarly, we, we section those small bones. And what we found is that uh, some of these fish, the oldest fish we found so far is uh, 30 years of age. So, and that's a pretty old fish for a predator fish. Look at that fish. Oh, yeah. How do you not get excited after catching a fish like that? And look at that circle hick right in the side of the small. Pop that loose. Pop it right out. This is what it's all about. See? Here, hold them way up. There you go. You're strong. She's caught in big ones before. I get excited about it. She doesn't get that excited. It's just another fish for her. But no, excellent job. Thirty-seven. All right, nice job. Want me to get it? Way back. Doom, doom, doom. Nice job. Hey, you know, it's almost five o'clock in the morning, and uh, of course, we got to hit the water at about seven out back on Lake Winnebago. And I'll tell you something, I've said this over and over, I'll sleep when I die. Because I'll tell you, when you have the opportunity to come out here and to experience the things that we've experienced the last two nights, and to see some of these giant fish and have the opportunities that we had, we certainly missed a lot of fish. We caught three really nice flatheads, and I learned a ton. And I tell you, you know, we don't really keep a lot of fish, and we don't really believe in, especially when you're fishing giant fish like this, is better off catch and release most of these fish. But I'll tell you, it is absolutely something when you see a flathead come up and you see that head that wide on that fish. And just to, you're sitting here a lot of times, and you're almost ready to fall asleep and all of a sudden you hear that clicker start clicking when that fish starts grabbing that sucker and starts making a, making a run for it. It's amazing how it's just like when you're sitting in the woods and all of a sudden you're bow hunting and you're scanning over the woods and, and you're kind of getting bored and you're getting relaxed and all of a sudden you see that giant buck come. That's kind of how I look at these flatheads is that, you know what, it's definitely their trophies and it's one of them very special things to enjoy. So, you know what? Let's pull these lines up and head for home. Good morning, girls. Time for you guys to do some work. Good morning. Who's gonna clean the house when they get home? Mommy even What's that? It's blanket. It's soaked. Oh. It's oh. soaked. Um. 
It's like a dry where my head was. <laughs> and wet wherever else my head was. Hey, hey, is it a great day to be alive? Sure. <laughs> I, that doesn't sound very convincing, Gracie. Hey, it was a tough day today fishing on Lake Winnebago, but I can't think of a better way to wind down and relax and sharpen my skills than reading the Badger Sportsman. It's a far from working experience.